Earlier this week, we were on the campus of Toronto Metropolitan University as part of the CIRC, the Canadian Excellence Research Chair, Migration and Integration Conference. We discussed whether how we talk about welcoming newcomers actually matches how we act. Our guests were Debbie Douglas, head of the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants, Goldie Hyder, President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada, and former Mayor of Calgary, Nahed Nenshi. Take a look. So I thought that maybe we could start talking about our own immigrant stories, because I think this is a whole panel of immigrants. Um, I came, my family came here as refugees, and I was around 10 years old. And I've been able to do many, many things in this country, including sitting up here in front of a group of people with distinguished guests, um, to have this opportunity to learn from all of them. Uh, I would never have had this opportunity in Uganda. But the thing, um, as much as I've gained from being in Canada, um, you know, Canada saved my life, but it destroyed my family. And I will come back to that, because I think we mm -hmm. hear the one narrative of the, the immigrant story where they come to Canada and everything is great, but it doesn't always work like that. So um, I wanted to get an idea of your immigrant stories. Uh, Goldie, maybe I'll start with you. What is your immigrant story? Well, we came to Calgary <laughs> in uh, 1974 from uh, India. And my brother and I and my parents, I think Dad said he had $28 uh, in his pocket at the time. Uh, not surprisingly, his foreign skills accreditation issues meant that he didn't continue pursuing journalism here. We started a family business called Calgary Home for about 25 years before my family and I moved uh, to Ottawa. I think it's just a vintage uh, immigrant story. The people that I work with in my business council, so many of our CEOs are, have those kinds of stories, including having been refugees who landed here, didn't speak a word of French or English, but went on to run Air Canada, for example, or now. Uh, you know, CIBC CEOs, parents came when these two brothers were the same. So the story is at all levels of Canadian life, and so it's just a small part of, of, our, of my story. Mm -hmm. And the head, what about you? I should, I should start with a disclaimer in case it gets spicy later. So <laughs> Goldie is, in fact, not just a Calgarian, but someone I've known my whole life. Um, I think we met when I was 16 and you were, I don't know, 40. So... <laughs> <laughs> I lost my vote. <laughs> so we're, we're very comfortable. We're very comfortable with one another. I'm actually not an immigrant. I was born about a kilometer and a half away from here at St. Mike's Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was pregnant when they immigrated uh, to Canada, so I always say I was born in Canada but made in Tanzania. <laughs> uh, and growing up, I always uh, wondered why my parents and my sister had these wonderful, ornate certificates of Canadian citizenship and all I had was a lousy birth certificate. <laughs> um, but I will say, and we're gonna get into some, some less nice things, I think, going forward, mm. but my immigrant story and Goldie's immigrant stories, maybe it's a Calgary thing, are exactly what you think they would be. Stories of struggle, of people coming, um, of not having their accreditations realized, of finding that, that this land was actually much tougher to live in in many ways than the land they came from but ultimately stories of success, and particularly stories of success for the next generation. Uh, and that's a, that's a very comforting thing that we tell ourselves as Canadians, that, you know, everything will sort itself out by the second generation, and the kids are going to be fine. There are a lot of problems with that. But I will say that in my life, I've been very lucky to have that, that very typical but very Canadian story. I always say my story is extraordinary precisely because it's so ordinary. Not everyone gets to be the mayor, you know, in the, as a first generation Canadian, but that story of service and sacrifice, but ultimately success, is a story that has been common in Canada. And I think it's important though for us to really focus on the people for whom it has not been the story and figure out what it is that we've done what it is we've designed and what it is we've allowed to happen by neglect to not make sure that that story is for everyone. And I'll have a lot to say about that, I think. That so you don't have to be extraordinary to, you know, be able to be part of the society. Exactly. Right. And Debbie? Um, similarly, I came to Canada just before I turned 11 um, from Grenada. I came to join my mom and stepdad. My mom had left 
um, a couple of, couple of years before to join my stepdad in the US. Um, after a couple of years and a brother, they decided that Canada was probably a better bet. My father um, wanted to come to do graduate studies. Um, I assumed that the uh, tuition here was cheaper than in the US. Um, but it was also because I think um, my father had, my stepfather had met um, a number of years prior, just casually on the beach in Grenada, um, this white Canadian tourist. And they um, set up a friendship that lasted over many years. And when my parents decided that New York wasn't going to cut it for them, um, he contacted this guy who happened to own a business who sent him a job letter. Um, and so he came in and a couple of years later, um, he was able to go into York University. Um, and my parents were able to get their permanent residence status. My mom, who was a teacher in Grenada, um, could not teach when she came and so ended up working as a practical nurse um, in a nursing home. Um, fast forward, I remember as I was thinking about this, um, a memory came back to me. My first year um, of my first week in school here, grade, I was supposed to go into grade five, and as we were registering, I could hear my stepdad um, with a raised voice, and I couldn't quite tell um, what it was that they were talking about, but I knew it was about me. Um, and I watched him approach me as I was sitting there wondering, you know, just looking around, everything was very new, um, very, very lots of whiteness um, around me in this elementary school. We were in North York, Jane and Finch. So imagine Jane and Finch in the early 1970s, um, not as it looks now, for those of you who know Jen, Jane and Finch. Um, and my, my dad said, you need to write a test. And being my grandmother's uh, grandchild, I stiffened my back and put on a confident face while inside I was thinking, why did you have to write a test? I just got to Canada, you know, I was thinking, you know, um, is it the same, you know, lessons that I had learned? And as it turned out, is because they wanted to put me back a year and my stepdad just insisted that they test me before making that decision. Um, and, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't let them. They wanted me to take ESL because I had a great, I spoke with a Grenadian accent and, and his thing was, she speaks English, it's the only language um, that we know. Um, long story short, I wrote the test, um, got through, I was placed in grade five. A year later, we found out I actually tested um, a couple of grades ahead, but of course they didn't put me um, forward. Yeah, at the end of that week, um, you know, and, and I was going through that week, right, and, and finding myself, and, and this is how identity gets formed. Um, I come from a majority um, black and Indo-Caribbean um, country, Grenada, um, with a few, you know, we saw white tourists, but not um, in any intimate way. So I had a lot of touching of my hair and, you know, I was interested in blonde hair that I thought probably felt like straw and I was very surprised that it was actually <laughs> soft. Um, but um, by the end of the first week on the playground, I got called the N-word and it shook me to my core. Um, and I looked around to see if anybody had heard and nobody said anything. And then I looked around to see what other kids looked like me because there weren't any in my um, class. And I saw one girl um, with a group of friends across and then I saw another boy um, playing tag with a group of young boys. And as it turned out, there were only three of us in a school of 500, there were three black kids. And I don't recall any other kids of color. And so that went on um, for, for two, for two, for two um, years that I was in that elementary school. Um, one of the other lessons I learned is that the next week when I went to school, I was called to the principal office and there was um, Bonnie Beckler, whose name I remember, and Bonnie, in case you're listening, um, who had called me the N-word and her mom was in the office and her mother had brought her to apologize. So clearly a teacher or somebody had seen and, um, and they had talked about it. Anyways, fast forward, my father gets his degree, can't, as an, in, in um, economics, can't find work anywhere. Um, ends up doing some financial planning, but mostly drove cabs um, to pay um, for, to take care of our family and died at a very young age. Now, if you ask my mother what her experience of migration has been, she will say it was very positive, that Canada has been very good to us. She has successful children. My, both my brothers went to school in the US. They're both, they're highly successful. One is a lawyer, one is in um, the medical field, um, and she's had a wonderful life. Um, but then once I started working, and I probably told the same story as you did, right? You came to Canada, my parents worked hard, um, we went to school, um, we now live a middle-class life. Um, it's a great migration story. 
But three decades ago, when I started working um, in the immigrant and refugee serving sector, starting, starting work with abused immigrant women, um, the reality really hit me in terms of what women was, were going through. Um, at the same time, I was becoming aware of what was happening with domestic workers. Um, and so I started paying attention to that, right? This whole story that you just heard from the three of us isn't necessarily the story. Nahed, um, we had a preliminary, uh, preliminary uh, conversation about this, and you said something that kind of stuck with me. You said that the Canadian immigration system is the greatest bait and switch hmm. system. What did you mean by that? So, I, I feel a bit spicy, so... We like spicy. Well, salad king's just across <laughs> we like the honesty. way, so I've got to get myself ready. Mm. But um, let, me, let me make a couple of propositions. Proposition number one is when we had President Trump in the U.S. and he was talking about reforming the immigration system in the U.S. and we as Canadians were like, ooh, that sounds terrifying and scary. He was actually talking about building a Canadian system in the U.S. He was actually saying rather than focus mm -hmm. on family reunification, we should focus on people with the best chances of succe succeeding economically. And so we have a system where if you want to come to Canada, well, there's a series of points you can win. Mm -hmm. Do you speak English or French fluently? Most important, are you educated in a profession that is in short supply in Canada? So you tick off all these boxes and in a very, very antiquated paper-based system, years later, you will hear from the Canadian authorities saying, congratulations, you can come to Canada. And probably nobody tells you that, oh, by the way, that profession that you work so hard to be trained in, yet we're not actually going to let you work in that profession. We're actually not going to accredit you in that profession. Uh, but by the way, we do need people in long-term care. We do need people to work in retail and in warehouses and as drivers. The reason I call this a bait and switch system mm -hmm. is this is not accidental. This is easy to fix. So I'm also a professor at Mount Royal University in Calgary. My office used to be on the same floor as the Faculty of Nursing. And the Faculty of Nursing at, the university, at Mount Royal University with our colleagues at the University of Calgary up the road had created something called a Bridge to Canadian Nursing Program. It's very successful. And it basically took foreign trained nurses from non-white countries, because the nurses from white countries had an easier way of it. I think you'd agree with that, Debbie. Um, but helped them get their Canadian accreditation. And it took about a year. There is a program that was just announced within the last month at Mount Royal University, at the place where I am on a very long leave, 12 years and counting, um, which was a new bridge to Canadian nursing program that can get people their nursing credentials in as little as a month. The Alberta uh, engineers, the professional engineers and geoscientists of Alberta, actually accredit more foreign trained engineers than they accredit Canadian graduated engineers every year. You can do it. We can figure out a way to train medical professionals and get them accredited very quickly because look, a Philippine medical graduate probably can be a family doc in Canada without any further training. Yeah. But we can, we can do a little bit to make sure. But right now, we charge them thousands and thousands of dollars to test. We force them into a system where it's impossible to get a residency. Why do we do that when there's a shortage of doctors? Well, we do it because we need LPNs. We need people at the front lines of the medical health care system that we don't have to pay as much. And so the argument that I'm making, the proposition I'll put forward, and I'm happy to be challenged on it, is that this is not accidental. This is by design. Whether through malice or neglect, we've designed a system, an economy, that only works when we have newcomers willing to take these jobs. So when we talk about our labor shortage that we're facing at this late stage, of, I hope it's a late stage of the pandemic, we almost never say that the reason we have a labor shortage is because we accepted very few immigrants for 18 months and it knocked our entire economy out of whack. We don't admit that. 
But I would argue that if we have created, design, created and designed a system that is so inherently unfair, we should have the political will, thank you, Andrew, from what people are saying, mm -hmm. how they feel about immigration, we should have the political will to be able to design a system that's better, to design a system that's more just. I just don't know if we do. I want to go to Goldie. At the beginning of uh, Nahed's um, answer, you were nodding and you stopped nodding. Yep. <laughs> um, I want to come to you, because I think you have um, a different perspective. But we recently did a story on what's been happening with uh, the health crisis in this country. We went to a town um, about two hours from here called Marmara. It's a community of 4,000 people, and there's only two doctors. The town has uh, all these incentives to try to get young doctors to come to the town to live and take care uh, of the people that live there. So for 4,000, as I said, uh, there's two doctors. We spoke to a doctor um, who studied um, abroad, who is trying to get placement, who wants to take care of people in this province. And I said to her, would you, she studied in Jamaica, um, and I said, would you go to Marmara? Would you be a doctor in that community? And she said, yes, but there's just, uh, there's not any kind of pathway for me to do that. Um, so to that point, Goldie, you've said that you want to demystify the feeling that immigrants are just for labor. I wanted to pose uh, Nahed, Nahed's uh, comments to you. Yeah, well, look, first of all, let me just say how proud I am to be Canadian. When you see those myths uh, and where they rank and where the immigration levels have been over the last 50 plus years, like this is not uh, possible in many, many parts of the world. Um, having said that, we should be cautious um, and, and not take it for granted. And I think it starts with, you use that phrase, I call it duping people. We dupe people um, when they come here. And what we've got to do is link all of these stories together. An immigration story is not a uniform story. It is about social policy. It is about economic policy. You know, it's about humanitarian policy. It's not either or, it's and. Uh, all of these things. And we shouldn't pigeonhole these categories either. It's not like refugees don't come here to work, um, that somehow they're just a cost to the society. And, and it's that humanitarian policy is an expense as opposed to, you know, a possibility of, 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 again, utilizing that talent and that skill set. When I speak with the members of the Business Council, which, you know, are a couple of million, who have a couple million employees or 50% of the Toronto Stock Exchange, Outside of cyber, the number one issue I hear from everyone is talent and labor shortage. And this is despite record levels uh, of immigration that are now coming in. I didn't believe that in my lifetime I would see 500,000 a year number. It's an astronomical jump from where we were in 1984, 1988, when Mr. Moroni's government raised it to 250, and we had stalled there for the longest time. I actually think we should stop talking about the number, <laughs> because we've gotten to where we need to get to. Uh, what we need to do now is make sure to, that we utilize those, uh, those, uh, th those numbers to do the things that we need them to do. You know, we're going to get soon to a level of where we're going to have two people working for one, uh, one retiree. Uh, that number used to be seven to one just 50 years ago, I think, if I remember correctly. We can't sustain that. We can't sustain living in an economy like ours in a country the size of ours. And so the first thing we need to do is make sure that we utilize everyone who's here. Uh, it's not about bringing more people just because we need them. The first job is to make sure that people who are here, including underemployed immigrants, underemployed women, uh, indigenous uh, groups that are underemployed, uh, people with disabilities that are underemployed, anyone who wants to work in Canada, we should facilitate their opportunity to seek and receive an, uh, employment. If we did that, the, record, the, 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 the data shows we'll still be short. And so we'll still need more and more people to come. And we've got to address the homegrown issue of foreign skills accreditation, which is not just a government issue. Frankly, it's a professional bodies issue. Mm -hmm. And it's really in a provincial domain where that needs to be addressed. Uh, Premier Mo, for example, just recently went to the Philippines and brought 500 nurses. He said, I'm bringing them and I need them because my system needs them. So we're going to have to systematically break down some of these barriers while maintaining support for immigration. Immigration is our secret sauce. It is a defining characteristic of what it means to be Canadian. This is a unique place. It's a unique experiment that doesn't work in many other countries. But to, to maintain that support, you can't dupe people on the way in. You must give them the chance to have 
the opportunity to participate fully uh, in, their, in their economic uh, prosperity. We have to create the conditions for that to happen. And I can tell you that in the business community, what we've been saying to the Department of Immigration and the Minister and others is, um, let us help you. Let, us, let this be a partnership. Uh, let's go together and promote Team Canada when we travel. Too often as Canadians, we go abroad and we, sell, we want to promote Ontario and Alberta. And you, find, you know abroad, nobody knows who that. You just know Canada. Uh, they might know Toronto, but they don't know much more beyond that. And so let's promote Canada. Let's do it in partnership where we can expedite approvals of people wanting to come in the country. You go for this booth and then the next booth says, oh, these are the employers that are ready to hire you. On the spot, why don't we create a nexus program for employment? Why don't we have a nexus program for universities and colleges to recruit students? Why must our governments do everything? Let's partner with them and ease that and give us the responsibility to help them get employed, to help them get housed. You know, we're, we're in for doing that. So we have to think differently about how we got here because how we got here is not the way we're going to get to where we need to get to. Uh, Debbie uh, Goldie said that immigration is the secret sauce uh, for Canada. Uh, you've said that, uh, you know, quote, we've seen so many bodies of African babies swept up by the ocean. Where's the outrage? Um, is the Canadian public welcoming of immigrants? Um, when I made that comment, the context was around our humanitarian program and who it is that Canada welcomes. So I strongly disagree that as Canadians, we welcome all equally. Um, we saw the difference in the response to um, the little Syrian baby that washed up on the shores and there was an outpouring of support from Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Our political parties were stepping all over each other to see who can take in more. It happened to have been an election um, period and so the Conservatives were saying 10,000, the Liberals decided that they're going to take in 40,000. And, and we saw Canadians just clamoring and renting homes and wanting to privately sponsor. Um, and at the same time, we were seeing the bodies of black African babies washing off on the shores of the Mediterranean. And I'm still waiting for the outcry. We watched it in the 1980s with Somalia, mm -hmm. right? When we watched Canad the Canadian military and the devastation of that country and we had Somalis here who for 10 years were in limbo, not being granted permanent status. Um, and we, we go back, right? I, I agree with um, Nahed that our immigration programs are intentional. 1911, when, we talk, when Canada talks about its relationship to black peoples, um, we often hear about the Underground Railroad. Um, we never hear about the enslavement of my people in Canada. We never hear that in 1911, Remember, 300 years after the first black person, who as a free person, landed here in Canada, 300 years later, there is an ordering council to stop black migration from the US to Canada. That's, part of, that's one of the narratives of Canadian immigration. In the 1950s, a domestic workers program for Caribbean women um, was set up, 3,000 women, because Canadian homes needed people to clean. And after a year, um, they were able to get grant, um, were granted permanent resident status, the beginning of two-step immigration for black people. We saw, we saw 10 years later, in the 1960s, the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program put in place a relationship between the Canadian government and the Jamaican government that was later brought into other Caribbean islands and, more, and later then to Mexico. Again, two-step immigration. But even for the agricultural, seasonal agricultural workers, primarily black men, no access to permanent residency. They come in for 10 months of the year, they, they harvest our food, they plant our food, they package our food, and then they're sent home. They pay into CPP, they pay income tax, they pay EI. Very, very few have access because as soon as they get sick, as soon as there is an accident, they are shipped back to the Caribbean. That too is, a, is an immigration, a Canadian immigration narrative. Canada's immigration system is racialized, it is gendered, and it is classed, right? We hear Goldie and um, Nahed talked about um, economic immigrants and how they come in and, and, and the trajectory and, and many of the things that you said is true. Um, I, think we, I think there are things we need to do to ensure folks who come in are able to um, reach their full potential, but we cannot pretend that we have a whole underclass of folks who are part of our immigration system. Um, last year in 2022, Jamaican workers in the seasonal agricultural program wrote a letter to the, to the government of Jamaica asking them to intervene 
in the ex to, to stop the exploitation that they were experiencing it. And they talked about the experience of being in the seasonal workers program as one of indentured servitude and systematic slavery. In Canada? In Canada, at this time. This was last year. The conditions on our farms are deplorable. But yet these are the employers that the Canadian government looks to, to help guide and to decide how these programs work. Right? So, so I don't buy that everyone is welcome into Canada because we see which we, we see temporary foreign workers. There's an explosion of temporary foreign workers. Goldie will tell you um, in Canada, international students, high skill levels, immigrants from temporary workers from Europe, temporary workers from Asia in many cases, um, are, have a pathway here. The folks who we need, who are building our houses, who are packing our meat, no pathways to permanent residency. And, and I know there's a, there's a small pilot that the government just announced yesterday that they were extending, um, but who is left out of that agricultural, it's called the agri-food um, pilot, who is left out? Seasonal agricultural workers who are primarily black men are not able to access that program. In 2018, um, a study shows that the city of Toronto estimated that about 40% of people who were using shelters identified as refugees or asylum claimants. And you know, a growing number of uh, newcomers to Canada are ending up in shelters or finding themselves unhoused. Yep. And we also know that um, a lot of Canadians are struggling to pay rent. Uh, they're having a, a really difficult time just getting on the housing uh, ladder. So can, it, can Canadian governments create enough affordable housing for immigrants and non-immigrants while also keeping in mind that people here already are struggling to you know, have houses to, and homes to live in? Yeah, the short answer is yes, and it's through the use of public policy. Housing is largely a density and a zoning issue and a labor issue. Uh, we need people to build those houses that everybody is, is asking for. So I think if we can deregulate some of these things and create and why ask me? Why not ask the former mayor who's yeah, involved in this, in this zoning? And there's a lot of nimbyism that goes on here as well. People say, yes, I support affordable housing, just not where I live. Yeah. And so we have to have those conversations. But Nyad, you would have direct experience as mayor. Yeah, so I'm very hesitant of this. This is a relatively recent uh, innovation in our discourse to really tie immigration to the housing crisis because the housing crisis, especially in this part of the country, is very much on people's mind. And I'm very hesitant to draw that tie together. They are two quite separate issues. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, we need to work on housing and know the answers are not near as simple as Goldie highlights, but I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> Leadership, um, I need. <laughs> but I'm very hesitant to tie those two things together. Why are you the, reason, the reason I'm hesitant is because the thing we didn't hear from Andrew is how deep those beliefs are. Yeah. So, for example, in Alberta right now, we're going through two horrible crises. Of course, we're having a terrible situation with wildfires, and we're also going through a particularly horrifyingly frightening provincial election. And the only thing that is not frightening about the political discourse in Alberta right now, and indeed in all of Canada right now, is we haven't seen anti-immigrant rhetoric but we've seen everything else in that recipe book. And you know, certainly the People's Party of Canada, who I'm still mad took my campaign color purple, <laughs> hit about 9% in the last election. They're about 3.5%, 4% in the mm -hmm. polls right now. That doesn't sound like much when we compare it to, for example, the European situation. But if a Danielle Smith or a Scott Moe or a Pierre Polyev or, oh, I don't know, a Francois Legault suddenly see <laughs> that the way to get above where they've topped out in their popularity at 30 odd percent with pretty hard right policies is to take an anti-immigrant narrative and that may get them from 30 percent to 40 percent which is what they need i'm not sure that the depth of the attitudes that andrew is talking about will hold yeah. because if it's a marginal difference of people and if we rile people up by saying, if we allow more immigrants in, that will exacerbate our housing crisis, then that is a very easy path that I see. And we've seen in a very short period of time, really the last five or six years, what are we, 2023, let's call it the last seven years, that things that were unthinkable yeah. to be in public policy in 2014 
or 2015 are now part of the, the mainstream rhetoric even of my premier in Alberta. And so, yes, there's a housing crisis. No, it's not about nimbyism. No, it's not about the cities blocking the creation of new housing. It's not about that at all. Uh, it really is about the lack of ability to build affordable housing, the fact that the development um, industry really has no incentives from a policy perspective to build housing that people can afford. And there's, there's an economic reason for that, very quickly. Mm -hmm. There's three costs of housing, okay? There's the cost of land, there's the cost of construction, and there's the cost of regulation. Basically, those three things are what it takes to build a home. But here's the thing, the cost of land is the same, whether you're building luxury condos or affordable housing. Shockingly, the cost of construction is the same. The granite countertops are a very small part of the overall construction cost. So if I'm a builder, what's my incentive to build housing that people can afford? So that's where policy comes in, the cost of regulation. There's a bunch of garbage data out there that says regulatory costs are adding hundreds of thousands of dollars to the cost of a home. I've never seen any evidence that that's actually true. Nor have I seen any evidence that there are gatekeepers in municipal government preventing housing from being built because we want housing to be built. Yes, there's NIMBYs and they show up at council with their signs. They never win. They rarely win. They sometimes win, okay but when they're really, really rich. But, <laughs> but usually council just overrules them, at least in Calgary. And I would, I would but, there's, but there's a big policy issue here around what can we do to encourage the private sector, because the private sector's gotta be the solution here, to actually build homes that people can afford. And it's not just about density, it's something much more fundamental about the economics. Yeah. Sorry, Debbie. Uh, no problem. I, and I, I, where I disagree with you is that I, I don't think it's only the private sector. I think we ended up in this housing crisis because the federal and provincial government absented themselves from building, oh, from, from building housing 100%. beginning in the, in the mid-1990s. Um, we, we had co-ops being built. And, and my concern when we talk about affordable housing um, in Toronto, affordability is defined as 80% of market. In $2,500 for one bedroom in Toronto, who can afford 80% of that if one it lives in poverty, right? So we need subsidized housing built. We need the federal government to get back into building housing. We need the provincial governments to get back into building housing. I am not as convinced as many people that private public Partnerships work very well. I think it benefits the private sector more so than anybody else. Um, and we're continuing to give developers free reign. We have a provincial government that um, even the conditions, even the little conditions that municipalities in the greater Toronto area, in Ontario mm -hmm. for that matter, were able to put on developers so that they're building community assets as part of building housing has been taken away by our provincial government, yeah. um, which then squeezes our municipalities even more so, oh, yeah. who are wanting a need like Toronto to build, to build housing. Um, for So I agree, it has nothing to do with immigration. I think it becomes a distraction and a dog whistle for those who are not wanting um, immigrants um, to come into Canada. And yeah, let me clarify one thing, because uh, I think I misspoke. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Government built or nonprofit sector built housing is an important part yes, of the solution. Absolutely. The problem is, I think that you need the whole funnel. Mm -hmm. And so, as it gets more and more expensive to buy a place, more and more people are renting. Rents go, go up. up. So, because rents go up, more and more people are seeking subsidized housing because they can't afford yeah. market rent, just as you say. So, the entire thing gets squeezed. Yeah. And you kind of have to open the valve at every level. To, to free that up, but I need to say that, you know, in Calgary, for example, we're short about 5,000 affordable housing units, and we're going through a massive building boom at the moment, but I'm the guy who cuts the ribbons, or I used to be, right? <laughs> so I'd be lucky to cut the ribbon on 150, 200 units a year of affordable housing. We need 5,000. And so the private sector has to be part of that solution because for us to increase the amount of affordable housing we're building by 25 or 30 times, no matter how sympathetic the federal or provincial governments are, it's hard for me to get my, my head around being yeah. able to do that. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.